guys, welcome to Thursday Morning Chapel. I'm really happy for today's chapel. We're going to hear a good, an awesome word. Sorry, not good, but an awesome word. Pastor Mike Bulls, not just that. We're going to have the worship team really lead us in the time of worship. And I just want to welcome you guys for today and really encourage each and every single one of us. You know, it's that time of the semester when, you know, midterms are just hitting us like trucks. And, you know, we're just getting tired. And, things, you know, it's just time of the semester when things really have been hitting us hard lately. And I just want to encourage each and every single one of us today to really dive into the time of worship. And not just that, to really have a, a, our posture, our hearts in a posture to receive what Pastor Mike Bulls has to say today. I just want to welcome you guys today to Thursday Morning Chapel. Good morning, Vanguard. So welcome you guys. Go ahead and worship wherever you guys are at. Just feel comfortable. Worship God's Thank you. 
Thank God for this day. Thank you for another day of life. God, I just thank you for the worship team for the awesome time of worship. And not just that, God, I pray today that you speak through Pastor Mike Bulls, God, that man, the word that he has, God, that it ministers to us, God. Let us just receive what you got today, Father. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, guys, it's my pleasure to welcome Pastor Mike Bowles. Good morning, good evening, Vanguard University students, wherever you find yourself watching this at the moment. Uh, I'm so excited and pumped to be here. My name is Michael Bowles. Um, before we get started, I want to take a seven-second praise break and make some noise for your leaders uh, of spiritual formation, Mike Whitford, Crystal Baca. Put the praise hands emojis in the chat and uh, shout them down virtually somehow in the chat. Um, get him a Starbucks gift card or something. I don't know. Anyway, um, I have lived in L.A. My wife and I just recently, um, after eight years in Los Angeles, we moved over Christmas uh, to a small town just south of Seattle called Sumner. You've probably never heard of it, and that's okay. Uh, and so we are adjusting to new life here in Washington. It's fantastic. It's such a difference, though. We were living in Southgate uh, in L.A., and we were part of, like, a Facebook group there. And uh, I immediately, I'm just like that guy that will join weird Facebook groups. And so before moving up here, I joined a Sumner Neighborhood Watch non-political Facebook group. And so I was comparing the differences. So in L.A., it would be like, hey, there was four shots on Martin Luther King uh, Boulevard. Does anyone know what's going on? You know, like the ghetto birds hovering over. And then I'd, I'd go over to the Sumner Neighborhood Watch group, and this post had a lot of traction Someone was like, hey, there's a sheep that is on its back in this pasture. Does anyone know the owner? I'm concerned. Or this one. Hey, we noticed that there was a fire hydrant that was moved from city council building. Does anyone know where that fire hydrant went? And so <laughs> it, is, it is so different living here, but my wife and I, we love it. Um, I work for Absolute Ministries it is a transitional housing provider that's faith-based that helps men and women coming out of either 30-day programs or programs like Teen Challenge assimilate into culture. We get them plugged in in local churches, connect them with mentors and different things. And you'll hear a little bit of my story at the end, and it'll kind of make sense for um, just the heartbeat that my family has for people um, coming out of life-controlling addiction. If you have your Bibles, you can go ahead and jump to the Gospel of Matthew. We're going to pick up in Matthew chapter 4. But before we do that, I kind of want to give some context to uh, the Gospels and give some shape to um, what, what we're reading, what the setting and landscape is that Jesus is um, coming up on the scene. What is he doing there? Um, what are the different groups that we read about? And um, there's a Greek word that I want to teach you. You probably already know it. Um, but it is the word that we kind of uh, interpret for gospel, and it's called euangelion. Why don't you say that with me right now? Euangelion. That's a fun word. And literally, that definition means good news. Now, Christians, we use that word uh, in reference to the good news of the gospel. But uh, during the intertestamental period, which is also known as the silent years, because it, at that point, uh, it kind of gets coined that because it's the point in our Bible where God is not speaking. I would argue that actually God is continuing to speak, but we end the Old Testament in Malachi, and then roughly 400 years and then we pick up in the New Testament. And so euangelion is not an exclusively Christian word. In fact, um, how, many, how many of you have ever heard of Alexander the Great before? Some of you. Um, I was in one person. I was in uh, Greece a couple years ago, and we were working with um, Syrian refugees, Kurdish, and um, different refugees outside of Athens, and um, at the end of that trip, 
I hopped over to visit one of my missionary friends in Macedonia. And in the square in Skopje, Macedonia, you have a giant statue of Alexander the Great. And maybe you could look behind me and you'll see um, the statue of Alexander the Great on there. But he's holding up his fist and he's like saluting his son who's across the river. But Alexander the Great had a gospel at that time that he was preaching. It was the good news of Hellenism. And if you've never heard of Hellenism before, there are four pillars of Hellenism. Essentially, Alexander the Great would say, contrary to the Romans, he'd say, hey, I don't need a, I don't need a legion of armies and soldiers. I don't need this uh, insane military force. If you just let me have education, healthcare, entertainment, and athletics, I can change your culture, and I could change the way that you think. I could change the way that you act. If you just give me those four things, education, healthcare, entertainment, and athletics, I will be able to influence you by the culture, and I will be able to bring this good news. What's ironic is today, even in politics, um, we are just at the end of uh, election, and um, that's kind of behind us, I think, hopefully. Um, but in election year, what, I mean, what do you see, where they're sending, media is sending messages about education. You know, politicians are talking about health care. Um, we see even in our entertainment with NBA players, if you watch the English Premier League, um, there's political things attached to um, even the sports that we watch um, in athletics. And so Alexander the Great, he had a philosophy of Hellenism that he introduced to Palestine and just influenced culture as we know it. And then you, not only do you have the euangelion of Alexander the Great, but you have the euangelion of uh, Rome, which was Pax Romana, which is Latin for Roman peace. So it is an illusion that if you lived in a Roman territory or province, that you had this peace. And so you had emperor worship that was introduced later, where emperors were attributed to be like gods or deities and worshiped like gods. And so here we have the gospel writers, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, who write these manuscripts. We have these manuscripts where it's the gospel according to Matthew, the gospel according to John. So you have to understand that them using euangelion is an incredibly subversive term in the landscape um, of Palestine in this cultural moment that we pick up with Jesus. And so they're saying, essentially what they're saying is, hey, I know that we have these competing ideas of what the gospel is. You have Hellenism, you have Pax Romana, but let me tell you the good news about Jesus Christ. And so we have Jesus entering the scene, and he's got all of these different people groups. Um, he has, there's the Sadducees, um, which are, I mean, if you've read your New Testament, you read about um, chief priests and teachers of the law. And I don't know about you, but it's easy for me to just kind of clump them in the same category. But actually, they are two different separate groups of people. The Sadducees were the chief priests. They were, um, in short, probably the best description, they were a corrupt religious mafia. I mean, they would get tithes, they would withhold tithes from other priests. Um, they were insanely corrupt. Then you had the Pharisees, which were um, pious Jews that were wanting to um, uphold the purity of Judaism. And so they were, I mean, we kind of, we read about them and we're like, man, they're hypocrites. They had laws that would, uh, you know, be serve as boundaries. So where they actually wouldn't break Mosaic law. And then you had probably one of my favorite groups is you had the Essenes. So when Hellenism came into the scene, you have the Essenes that were like, I just, I don't want to be in the city. I don't want to be, um, I don't want to be influenced by culture or any of these things that Alexander the Great or uh, any of the stuff that 
is sweeping our city right now. So they fled to the desert. They fled to the desert to avoid Hellenism. And um, the book of Ezekiel, a prophet Ezekiel, extols them to be sons of Zadok, um, staunch opponents of paganism um, through the era, era of pagan worship and whatnot. And so the Essenes, I love them because I think living in Los Angeles, it is, I mean, you have billboards, you have uh, things that are paid to be on your social media feeds that influence you. And I just remember when I was living in the city, my wife and I, we lived in Hollywood for five years. Um, we needed to get away, and we needed to go to the mountains. We needed to go to Malibu, and we needed to let um, kind of like creation reset us spiritually, physically, and emotionally from the concrete jungle that we're living in. So the Essenes, I have like a, a heart cry that resonates with the Essenes. I mean, their mantra verses for why they fled from Hellenism were verses like Jeremiah chapter 6, verse 16, that reads, this is what the Lord says, stand at the crossroads and look, ask for the ancient paths, ask where the good way is and walk in it, and you will find rest for your souls. And then another one of their verse mantras, um, reason why they fled to the desert is Isaiah 40 verse 3, a voice of one calling in the wilderness, prepare the way for the Lord, make straight in the desert a highway for our God. So who's in a scene? Well, John the Baptist, if you remember, his father was Zechariah. And in the New Testament, you actually read um, the New Testament writers will say uh, a righteous priest, Zechariah. And at that time, it's kind of a play on words. It's like an oxymoron because there wasn't a righteous priest. But John the Baptist would have belonged to this group of the Essenes. So where do we find John the Baptist in the New Testament? He's in the wilderness. And... He's probably looks crazy, and but he believed that he was creating a highway for our God. And we know as Christian readers that he is preparing the way for Jesus. He is a forerunner for Jesus. And so the Essenes, they believed that they would see God by being so devoted and practicing all these spiritual disciplines. And, and think about this. Um, where did we find all these manuscripts? Dead Sea Scrolls, Qumran. These were um, communities of the Essenes. So they, they had, um, we've had archaeological discoveries of these large rooms. I know this is kind of teachy right now, but I think it's important for where we're going to pick up in Matthew chapter 4. But they have these large rooms that we've discovered that had big giant tables. So there'd be four people in a room and one person would be copying manuscripts, papyrus, of the New Testament. And this is like how serious they took this process. So there'd be one person that would be writing. There'd be one person standing over them. There'd be another person over here um, making sure that the word that they were writing, they would read it and make sure that they were um, writing the same word. There'd be one person behind that person making sure that he said the right word. And so every time they would get to the word God or Yahweh, they would actually stop before they said it, go out to, they had many mikvah baths, and they would baptize themselves to be ceremonially clean. Now think about how many times they must have had to do that um, every time they came to the name of God. But they, they wanted to get away from the city, get away from Hellenism, to preserve the pure way of uh, just pursuing God, spiritual disciplines, writing these manuscripts. And think about it. Were they wrong? I mean, who shows up in, in the community of the Essenes? John the Baptist. Where does Jesus appear? A few miles away from Qumran, doesn't he? Um, by Galilee. And so you have this story where, uh, you know, Jesus goes into the desert to be tempted, and then we pick up in Matthew 4, just right after that, and I know I'm leaving out um, the Zealots and some other groups, the Herodians. Uh, man, I would encourage you, um, get with a group of friends and just Google or Wikipedia the snot out of these groups. Uh, you'll be guaranteed to have a good time. There's a lot of rich content um, about them, 
But then we pick up in Matthew chapter 4, and this is kind of an obscure portion of Scripture that sometimes when we're reading about, you have the temptation of Jesus, and then you have this portion, portion of Scripture, and then after it, you go to um, where Jesus calls the first disciples. But this one doesn't get a lot of attention, and I kind of wanted to pick up here because I think it's so important um, for us to just understand what Jesus um, is doing and, and what who he believe like what he believes about himself. So in Matthew 4 verse 12 it says this now when he heard that John had been arrested, John the Baptist, he withdrew into Galilee and leaving Nazareth, he went and lived in Capernaum by the sea. If you don't know anything about Capernaum, it'd be the um, equivalent to like a Harvard. It'd be um, scholars, it'd be expensive, uh, compared to by the sea in, in the territory of Zebulun and Naphtali. So that was spoken by the prophet Isaiah, so that what was spoken by the prophet Isaiah might be fulfilled. Verse 15, the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali, the way of the sea beyond the Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles, the people dwelling in darkness have seen a great light. And for those dwelling in the region in the shadow of death, on them a light has dawned. And then I love this verse in Matthew 4, 17. It says this, From that time, Jesus began to preach, saying, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Wait, he shows up, he's beginning his ministry, um, and we seem to think he's around 30 years old. He's beginning his ministry, and he's saying, repent? He hasn't even died yet. Like, there hasn't been a cross. There hasn't been, you know, burial, him in a tomb, a resurrection. I don't know about you, but when I hear the word repent growing up in church, I've always just assumed that repent was like, you know, I need to make a 180. I need to turn the other direction. And I think in part it is that. But what Jesus is actually saying here is he's saying, change the way that you are thinking because the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Or other translations will say, the kingdom of heaven has come near. And what is he talking about? He's talking about himself. And Jesus, all throughout the narrative of the New Testament, he talks about himself, right? Do you remember, I think he's in front of the Sadducees and Pharisees, and he says, yeah, this temple, in th I'll destroy it, and in three days, I'll rebuild it. And what is he talking about? He's talking about himself. So the kingdom of heaven has come near in Jesus. And I just think that's so important to, to just wrestle with and think about, because he's saying, change the way that you're thinking. Josephus, in one of uh, his writings, he's even he even makes like, an allusion to the word repentance, he says, hey, change the way that you're thinking. Repent. Think differently. D.A. Carson, he says, with John the Baptist's removal from the scene here, Jesus' ministry entered a new phase. The function of the forerunner was over. The one to whom he pointed had come. And this transfer might be neatly indicated by beginning the account of Jesus' ministry from the time of John's imprisonment. Carson also goes on to say in Matthew, Galilee is of profound significance because it heralds the fulfillment of prophecy. You have that little piece of Isaiah we read in verse 14 through 16 and points to the gospel's extension to all nations that you have in Matthew 28, 19. And I just want to read um, Isaiah chapter 9, the beginning of it, because John is writing to a Gentile audience, and he is building up. I mean, when we think about the gospel of John, it's kind of like an apologetic for Christ's deity, for who Jesus is. And he says in verse 2, the people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. Those who dwelt in a land of deep darkness, on them has light shined. Verse 3, you have multiplied the nation, you have increased its joy. They rejoice before you as with joy at the harvest, 
as they are glad when they divide the spoil. Verse 4, for the yoke of his burden and the staff for his shoulder, the rod of his oppressor, you have broken as on the day of Midian. For every boot of the tramping warrior in battle, tumult, and every garment rolled in blood will be burned as fuel for the fire. For to us, a child is born, to us, a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government, there will be no end. And so John's including this uh, in this account because he's saying, hey, what Isaiah prophesied, who, pro- who Isaiah was prophesying was going to come, this is him. It's in Jesus. So when we want to know who God is, who do we look at? We look at Jesus. Colossians chapter 1, verse 15, Paul very eloquently writes, Jesus, he is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For in him, all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell, and through him to reconcile himself to all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of his cross. Think about right now for a second, like this is the gospel. Like very blatantly, I know there's a ton of controversy right now in the academy of what the gospel is, but I think it's safe to say very plainly, the gospel is embodied in Jesus. And I mean, being a Trinitarian, we would say that we have God the Father who sent his son Jesus and the Spirit empowered Jesus for his mission to reconcile humanity unto himself, God. And I just, when I read portions of what Isaiah is writing about uh, a light that's going to shine in darkness, I just think about, I think about my own story and I think about my own life. And how the gospel impacted my life and it changed the way I think. And, you know, when I was, when I was born, I got, uh, I was kind of a product of uh, a drug deal. And um, my mom had slept with my dad for drugs and got pregnant and actually went into Teen Challenge um, right after she had given birth to me. And I was in a very sketchy living situation, and I got adopted at five months. And um, I got adopted by amazing uh, Christian parents. I grew up in church. I mean, Sunday morning, Sunday night, Tuesday night, outreach night, Wednesday night, Bible studies. Um, I was always at church, and it probably didn't help that we live, like, right around the corner from our church. Uh, But I was always at church. And I knew at a young age that God had a calling on my life. And I remember being nine years old, and I was on the playground uh, at school, and I was playing a game called tetherball. Has anyone ever heard of tetherball? Do we still play that? Is that still at schools? Um, I was playing tetherball. And now you know you are whooping someone in tetherball when you're, like, doing this number. So I was like sending the ball sailing over uh, this girl's head, and I was just whooping on her in some tether ball. Now, I don't know if you have this friend, but, you know, you could be playing any game, and you could be winning, and your friend just takes it personal and just takes a shot at you. And you're like, whoa, bro, like, te pasas, bro, like, that's way too far. <laughs> this is Chinese checkers. Like, why'd you have to say that? And so I was beating this girl in tetherball, and she took it personal, and she looked at me and said, oh, yeah, well, your parents aren't your real parents. And I remember being nine years old and just having everything unraveled inside of me. Like, everything I believed to be true just came unraveled. And I remember I walked home that day from school, and that was a long walk. And I asked my parents, like, hey, she said this, is it true? 
and come to find out that what that girl told me on the playground, nine years old, was true. And from that moment, sent just a spiral inside of me, just struggling with rejection, abandonment, um, just longing for acceptance, longing to be loved. And I remember even thinking, like, why would my birth mom and dad, like, give me up for adoption? Like, did I do something wrong that, that they didn't like? Was I, was I not good enough? And so I found myself, because I dealt with all of these issues inside of me, um, I found myself um, choosing a lifestyle of being promiscuous, um, disrespecting authority, drug addiction, drinking, partying, um, just anything and everything, trying to just find satisfaction for my soul. And I remember just life got completely out of control, and God allowed certain events in my life to happen that would put me in a position where I would respond to the gospel, right? Like Jesus saying in Matthew 4, 17, repent for the kingdom of heaven has come near. So God allowed all these situations and circumstances to happen in my life that were incredibly profound to put me in a place where I would be responsive to the gospel, to the good news. And some of those events, I mean, you've probably heard stories, um, overdosing uh, and getting dropped off at the hospital. Um, I remember getting in fights that I probably shouldn't have walked out of. But there was one event that happened um, that really shook me to my core. And, uh, you know, I'd grown up uh, even kind of hitting church a little bit with one of my friends, and um, we'd grown up in church a little bit together, and um, we kind of lived near each other until his parents got a divorce, and uh, he moved to another side of town, and I found myself selling heroin um, to this friend that I grew up in church with, and um, it was a Sunday night, and I had sold him um, like a half gram, and uh, that next morning, I get phone calls and texts that his mom went to wake him up uh, to go to his job, and he was blue in the face. He had overdosed and died. And I remember in that moment, just really like taking inventory of my life and just thinking, like, what am I doing with my life? Like, is this it? And at this point in in my story, like I had been in a crazy car accident, at going 80-something miles on the freeway walked out untouched, and I think in this point in my story, I just knew that, like, God's grace was pursuing me, and God was relentlessly chasing me down, and I just kept running from it, you know, and so I made a decision. I was like, okay, God, I'm not going to run any longer. I made a decision to go to Portland Teen Challenge, and uh, this was September 6th of 2010, and if you've ever been to Portland, anyone ever been to Portland before? If you've ever been to the Pacific Northwest, uh, it is rainy, it is overcast, it's cold. Uh, we literally just had like a foot or so of snow. Um, it's, it's overcast all the time, it rains a lot. So just picture me, I'm like withdrawing, uh, just being full transparent. You know, you guys are young adults, um, probably watch worse things on Netflix. But I go into Portland Teen Challenge and I'm addicted to heroin. I'm on 120 milligrams of methadone. I've been using, um, you know, different other substances, methamphetamines. And, and so I get there. I'm withdrawing. I'm sick. I can't sleep. And um, my third day there, this Portlandian mountain lady comes over to me. And uh, she just says, hey, I feel like God told me to come over here and tell you something. And I just remember being, you know, so jaded from all the Christianese language and all those church things we throw around. And I just looked at her. I'm like, what the hell are you going to tell me, lady? That, like, God loves me. That God's got a plan for my life. Get out of my face. And I'll never forget what that lady said next. She closed her eyes and she said, you should be dead. God loves you so, so much. And then she started speaking about things in my past that there's no way anyone could know about. And then she started speaking about things that God had put in my heart at a young age that nobody could know about. And I immediately just lost it. Like, 
just started crying. And it's like the, the type of crying where you're having a hard time breathing. <laughs> Um, like it's, it's kind of a violent cry. And if you've watched like a walk to remember, it's like that moment where you find out she has cancer and you're like, uh, it just like rips you apart. I was crying, mocos everywhere, boogers everywhere. It was really bad. And that lady just prayed for me in that moment. And, um, it was beginning the process of like where the gospel, where Jesus was starting to change the way I, w- I was thinking. He started to soften my heart, started to prepare me for what was to come later that night. And she prayed for me, and and she left not knowing the impact that she would have on my life. Like, she left not knowing just her simple act of just seeing gold in the midst of what looked like garbage uh, would do in my life. And, uh, you know, I, I don't have any contact with her today. I have no way to, I don't know her name. I don't have any way to, like, thank her. Um... But, you know, hopefully someday in heaven, I'll be able to hug her and thank her just for um, loving someone that looked a little different, you know, that was going through some different stuff. And that night, you know, up to this point, it was the third night I'd been there. I'd been kind of skipping out on some of the chapels. I didn't want to go. I didn't want to hear about Jesus or any of that stuff. You know, I I grew up in church. I probably knew more than uh, most of the other guys, um, which could be dangerous, but... I remember just like kind of coming to the end of myself and praying, God, if you're real, which is an incredibly dangerous prayer to pray um, because we serve a God that always responds when we cry out to him. And uh, I just prayed, God, if you're real, I need to know that you're with me. I need to know that you're in my corner. I need to know that you're, you're for me and not against me. And I just prayed specifically, God, I don't want to hear some vacation Bible school story I've heard my whole life. Um, I, I need to know that you're in this with me. And that guest pastor came in that small Portland chapel, slammed his Bible down, and said, I'm not going to give you some vacation Bible school story you've heard your whole life. I'm going to talk to you about surrendering your life to the will of God, scrapping any plans that you have for your life, and giving everything to Jesus. Because if Jesus isn't Lord of all in your life, he's not Lord at all. And I remember everything he was saying was just like piercing me right to the core of who who I was and who, you know, right to my heart. And I was just like, man, I'm ready. And so uh, at 8.36 p.m., September 8th, 2010, I went up to that preacher and I said, hey, you don't know me. You, didn't know, you don't need to know my story, but I've been running from God and I need to rededicate my life to him. And so at 8.36 p.m., I rededicated my life for what was probably like the 11th time <laughs> or 32nd time, who knows, Um, you know, and I'd love to say things were just daisies and roses from that point on and things were amazing and things were good. Um, but it actually got a lot harder. You know, I got, um, bad news from, uh, just about friends, either friends overdosing and dying or friends getting picked up on crazy charges and going to prison. And, um, you know, and, and at the same time, all that's going on, God's like refining me and working out all of this stuff in me, but I just kept having faith in Christ, faith in God that like, man, Jesus gave me an invitation to respond and to think differently about him, and I accepted that invitation, but then he also gives the invitation to participate in the new thing that he's doing now, and I love N.T. Wright in a book he wrote called Simply Good News. He says, the gospel is both an announcement and an invitation. It's an announcement that God is doing something new in Jesus. And I just remember, like, being so broken, having so much residue from my past life and addiction, just a lot of that, those memories still being fresh. There was just a little glimmer of hope in me that, like, man, I, I don't know how, but I want to be a part of the new thing that Jesus is doing now on this earth. And so I went to a Bible school in Los Angeles that David Wilkerson started called the Teen Challenge Ministry Institute. And not because I wanted to be in ministry at all. I just knew, um, you know, I had been a personal trainer. I worked in a gym for a while. And I knew that, uh, you know, following Jesus is not just some quick fix. You know, I, I knew that I'm not just going to go to church on Sunday and it's going to be a quick fix and I'm going to be good. That I really needed some just intentionality Um, studying scripture, um, applying spiritual disciplines, um, being accountable. 
And so I just wanted a foundation. So that's why I went to uh, the Teen Challenge Ministry Institute there. And uh, it was there that I met my wife. And shortly after, we got married. And um, we moved to Hollywood and been a part of uh, some great works that God has been doing in L.A. And we have a four-year-old little baby boy. And uh, we haven't announced it yet, but hopefully by the time this premieres, we'll have announced it. Um, But my wife is 14 weeks pregnant. We're expecting another baby. So don't post about that just yet. Make sure that we posted it. But you guys are getting some exclusive news. And... um, you know, I've, I've had the privilege to go all over the world, you know, Central America, uh, the UK, Scandinavia, um, Greece, Macedonia, um, to just share my story. And, and it's just been so humbling, um, even in the Philippines, working with uh, the government there at a time where martial law, they were killing people um, that were drug ad- in drug addiction or were selling drugs, and working with the government uh, to, like, in, like, in, introduce some recovery methods of working with people like, hey, uh, don't kill us like there's hope for us. Like, look at my life. And um, I know that some of those things may not be the story for you, but um, man, following Jesus is such an adventure because Jesus is doing something new um, all over the world. And sometimes we get like, we hear testimonies like what I just shared. And we think that, man, if I want to do something for God, it needs to be something that's really big. You know, it needs to be something that's, I need to go uh, have this huge revival meeting in Colombia, where, you know, and whatever. But it, it's, it's the small things, you know. It's the small, just saying yes to Jesus and the small things. You know, I just, early on, I just said yes. Like, God, whatever you have for me, yes, I'm going to do. And eventually what happened is those yeses then turn to big things, you know. Those small little acts of trust in God turned into bigger things. And now I get to just do things that I never thought I would ever get to do. Um, work for a faith-based nonprofit that we own duplexes on Lake Taps, which is a really nice area in Washington, where we get to disciple men and, and women that are still fresh coming out of drug addiction. Even even a year and a half isn't, isn't very long, and we're getting to uh, extend grace when they mess up and when they fall, just because we understand, man, sometimes relapse is part of just the recovery journey. And I don't know where you find yourself at watching this. And I don't know what God has uniquely gifted you or put inside you. I don't know what your past is and what God's brought you out of or saved you from. But I do know, no matter where you find yourself, anything that you do for God is a big deal because we serve a big God. And so um, I think we'll be surprised when we get to heaven on just how many things that maybe here on earth we wrote off as failures. We're going to be surprised in the sovereignty of God, just how he redeems things. And I think my life is just an example, if anything, to you of just a life that has been redeemed. You know, I, I got arrested my senior year right before graduation, and I didn't get to walk across the stage because I was in jail. I, I was forced then to get a GED, and um, years later, I went to, started going to junior college, and that absolutely sucked. <laughs> junior college sucks, and went to junior college, and then I did my undergrad, and uh, I got a bachelor's in religion with an emphasis in biblical and theological studies, and now I'm uh, at Western Seminary in Portland uh, working on a master's of arts in biblical and theological studies, and and it's just It's so humbling because God has redeemed my life. So I don't say any of that to say like, hey, look at how awesome I am. You just talk to my wife and she'll tell you uh, areas that I suck at. But um, I say that to say like, man, God has done a new thing in me and he's using me to do a new thing in just wherever I'm at. And I know that if he can do that in me, he can do that for you. And I think most pastors would probably say, I know uh, Mike and Crystal would probably say, a reason that they're a part of the spiritual formation team at Vanguard University is because they want you to not just be blessed, but to be more blessed than they could ever be and do greater things than even they could do. And so as we close, um, I just want to encourage you, you know, the gospel, like God's grace isn't just some sweet perfume that 
covers the stench of our sin, but it's actually uh, through the Holy Spirit, uh, a thing that can empower us to live differently. And part of that living differently is getting over ourself and being brutally honest about what's really going on in our soul. And I don't know where you find yourself watching this or if you're in a group or if you're watching it by yourself, but um, I think some that, something that we can learn from our Catholic brother and sisters uh, is just the art of confession. And I feel like that is such a lost art um, in most Christian circles today. Hopefully it's, you know, if it's, hopefully that's not the case for you, but um, man, I would encourage you to just confess some sin, confess some stuff, what's really going on. And if I can just give you permission that it's okay to not have everything together and it's okay to still have residue from your past that you're working through, it's okay that you're still, you know, fighting off this temptation. Man, I think it's when we kind of give up the fight and throw up our arms that that's a red flag. You know, keep fighting the good fight of faith. Do not grow weary in doing good for at the right time you will reap a harvest if you do not give up. So let's pray. God, we just thank you so much for the good news of the gospel that is Jesus of Nazareth. God, as uh, Isaiah, we read uh, towards the end of, of that portion in Isaiah that we read, it's King of Kings, Lord of Lords, uh, wonderful counselor. I mean, you, you're you one God, but you have many names because you can do many things. And so, God, we just thank you so much for you being who you are. And, God, I pray that um, no matter where we find ourselves watching this in this moment, that we would have that moment of just repentance where you would change the way that we're thinking about maybe our job, change the way that we're thinking about maybe that person that we're wanting to give up on that um, hasn't changed on the timeline that we think they should have. Um, change the way that we think. Change the way that we think about our community. Change the way that we think about our city. Um, and we're so excited for what you have ahead of us in the future. Um, we don't look at the future in fear or in dread um, because you have gone before us and you have prepared a way that is good. So we are excited and full of faith for the future. And everyone full of faith gave a real loud amen. Awesome. See you guys.